Hello, and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans, such as myself, will hear that a movie is based on a true story. A few of them we know, but most, well, we never go on to find out just what that true story is. So, in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. The 1980 movie The Shining is an adaptation from Stephen King's book of the same name. It was directed by Stanley Kubrick and it is no secret whatsoever that King was not particularly fond of the movie. Now, I completely understand his reasons, which we will get into later, but the movie itself, in my opinion, is a masterpiece. The visuals are stunning. Jack Nicholson absolutely knocks it out of the park, and Shelley Duvall's terror is palpable. If you are a fan of scary movies and you haven't seen The Shining yet, shut this podcast off go watch it. You will not regret it. The movie is about the Torrance family, Jack, Wendy, and Danny. Jack has had mm, some trouble in his past, but is attempting to turn over a new leaf and accepts a position as the winter slash off-season caretaker of the Overlook Hotel. The chef of the hotel takes the family into the kitchen during their tour when we find out that the old man shares a gift with Jack's young son. He calls it Shining. It's a sort of supernatural gift that can differ between the very select few who actually have it. For Danny, He interprets his gift or his shine as a little boy named Tony that lives in his mouth that can give him hints about the future or help him see energies of people who have passed on. The old man warns little Danny that the hotel is a bit scary, but they are just like pictures in a book and not to worry about them. Once everyone is gone and the massive old hotel is completely deserted, save the Torrance family, Jack tries to throw himself back into his writing, but finds he's having a very difficult time. Wendy goes about the duties of taking care of the hotel and Danny spends his time roaming the halls in his big wheel. As the snow comes and the utter isolation and remoteness of this hotel begins to wear down on Jack, he slowly starts to unravel. Danny finds himself not only witnessing strange things going on in the hotel, he is also drawn to the very room that the old man had warned him to stay out of, room 237. Wendy herself struggles to maintain a level of normalcy for her family, the responsibilities to the hotel, and to understand why Jack, her beloved husband, seems to be on the verge of a mental breakdown. Again, if you haven't seen this, please do. So the hotel in The Shining is based on a very real hotel named the Stanley Hotel, which is located in the mountains of Estes Park, Colorado. So let's get into some history of that area. Now, many of you have listened to my podcast about the movie Ravenous and the Utah Indians. Through the late 1700s, this tribe dominated this mountain region, but through time, had to share their territory with the Arapaho, the Comanche, the Shoshone, and even the Apache tribes. Then in the 1790s, the Arapaho lived in this region due to the Sioux pushing them there. The first permanent white settlers were Joel and Patsy Estes, 
which is where the town and the area got its name. A man named William Byers, who was a founding editor of the Rocky Mountain News, was with a group of people who were attempting to climb Long's Peak in 1864, but failed. The Estes couple invited them to stay with them, and Byers wrote about his experience in that part of the Rocky Mountains. He said, quote, Eventually, this park will become a favorite pleasure resort, unquote. Though the Estes family did eventually leave, by 1874, the area was opened up for settlement under the Homestead Act. It didn't take long for the first settlers to see just how profitable it was to entertain seasonal visitors. And the visitors came in ever-increasing numbers, describing the mountain area as being a rival to Switzerland in its beauty. Now, as the small settlement of Estes Park began to develop into a small town, people needed electricity, fresh water, and, well, let's face it, sewage management. A man by the name of F.O. Stanley, who had come to the Estes Valley in 1903 to get some rest and recuperation due to having tuberculosis was the force behind providing those, though the citizens themselves also helped. Stanley was a genius and he had invented the steam-powered automobile. The townspeople also constructed a fish hatchery on Fall River. They introduced the mighty elk that had been hunted out before they built roads and hiking trails and so on. All of this was to further bring in the tourists. The Stanley Hotel itself was built between 1907 and 1909 and it stands beautifully nestled on the north side of Estes Park. The hotel and the mountains behind it are absolutely breathtaking and is said to be only an hour to an hour and a half away from Denver, Colorado. It officially opened in 1909 and was a grand opening indeed. People saw that, as remote as it was, it had electricity, ensuite bathrooms, working telephones, uniformed staff, and a fleet of automobiles. Imagine seeing something like that back then. By 1917, the town was pretty well established and Stanley was the main component of that. The area is surrounded by Rocky Mountain National Park, established in 1915. Okay, so Mr. Stanley and his wife Flora eventually sold the hotel but still spent summers there at a private residence that they owned. Flora passed away in 1939 and Mr. Stanley in 1940. It was said that he was 91 years old. The subsequent hotel owners had a rather hard time maintaining this huge resort and hotel and there was just no profit to be made. So it was sold time and time again. Now it is believed to be one of the most haunted hotels in the United States. There is an astounding number of paranormal reports that come from the hotel. So let's set the scene. The hotel was built atop a bed of quartz and limestone and many people believe that those are the reasons why the spirit energy is so strong in the hotel. This is called a vortex of natural spiral of energy. In 1911, a woman named Elizabeth Wilson was a maid at the hotel. She entered room 217 to clean and inspect with a lit candle. Now the hotel was heated with gas. 
there was a supposed gas leak in the room and the flame on her candle ignited it. Boom! Exploding and sending her, quite literally, through the floor into the McGregor dining room below. She suffered two broken ankles, among other injuries, but thankfully survived. The Stanleys, of course, took care of her after the incident, and she continued on to work for the hotel for the rest of her life. The story is, is that she continues to haunt the Presidential Suite 217, supposedly folding and putting away the clothes of the people who are staying in the room. It is said that she does not like unmarried couples staying in the room and will move things around in disapproval, or the couple will feel a, quote, cold force between them while sleeping. People have heard a female disembodied voice in the night, as well as seeing her apparition walking through a wall that was once a doorway. Supposedly, if you leave her room a mess, she will, quote, poke you in the ribs as if to say, hey, look at the state of this room. And yes, you can rent this room. Now, Mr. Stanley and his wife, Flora, are also said to haunt the hotel. People have said that they have seen him throughout the hotel, but he is most noted for sightings in the hotel's bar, as if he is still, you know, supervising the goings on inside. Flora herself was a talented musician in her day, and she loved to play the piano. People say she still plays the piano and music can be heard coming from the music room and in the concert hall on the property. Even being able to see the keys moving on the pianos. But if you cross the threshold into the room, the music will suddenly stop. Another place people have observed seeing apparitions is the hotel's grand staircase just inside the main front doors. Some who take pictures of it claim to have seen apparitions of women in turn-of-the-century clothing standing on its steps. But the supposed most haunted area of the hotel is the fourth floor. That was the area where the maid's living quarters were and was at one point just an attic. People say that they can hear children playing, running up and down the hallways and giggling profusely, even when there are no children in that area whatsoever. Room 401 is another haunted room. Lord Dunraven, who the Stanleys bought the land from, is said to haunt this room. The closet in the room supposedly opens and shuts by itself. Room 428 is also reported as a hotbed of paranormal activity as guests say they can hear footsteps above them as well as furniture being moved around them. People have said they've seen a friendly cowboy sitting at the corner of their bed who watches them sleep. The concert hall where people report hearing Flora playing piano well, there was a man that worked in the hotel back in the day named Paul, and he was a general handyman, you could say. There was a strict 11 p.m. curfew at the hotel, and people that were still in the concert hall have said that they have heard a disembodied voice say, Get out! A man that was working in the hall on some construction reported that he felt Paul poking him while he was sanding. Now, underneath the hotel are some underground caves that the hotel workers and staff used to move around the hotel back in its early days. People have reported feeling as though apparitions are, quote, breezing past them in these caves, though again, there is a high concentration of limestone and quartz there. It is reported that a former chef is down there and he is responsible for the scent of home-baked goods 
that can sometimes be detected when there is no food around. Others have reported seeing the glowing green eyes of a cat that is actually not there. Another ghost that reportedly haunts the hotel is Lucy, who was apparently a homeless woman who died there from exposure to the cold during the bitterly cold winters that happened there. She delights in, quote, speaking with paranormal investigators as well as entertaining the spirit children. There is also a mirror that people have dubbed, quote, the creepy mirror. It is stored in the basement of the concert hall. It is very old, older than the hotel itself, and it is thought to house many trapped spirits within. When people take pictures of the mirror, they have reported seeing figures standing right next to them in the reflection that were not there when the photo was taken. But the most famous story coming out of the Stanley Hotel is its most famous visitor, Stephen King. Here is a quote from King. Quote, in late September of 1974, Tabby and I spent a night at a grand old hotel in Estes Park, the Stanley. We were the only guests as it turned out. The following day, they were going to close the place down for the winter. Wandering through its corridors, I thought that it seemed the perfect, maybe the archetypal setting for a ghost story. That night I dreamed of my three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. I woke up with a tremendous jerk, sweating all over, within an inch of falling out of bed. I got up, lit a cigarette, sat in the chair looking out the window at the Rockies, and by the time the cigarette was done, I had the bones of the book firmly set in my mind. It was indeed in 1974 when Stephen King and his wife Tabby were temporarily residing in Boulder, Colorado. They decided to visit the Stanley Hotel where, as King stated, they found out they were going to be the only people there and could only stay one night. He was already toying with a story idea that he had tentatively titled Dark Shine that would take place in an amusement park, but he felt the terror needed to be from a more isolated place. The locals in the area spoke of the Stanley Hotel, so he and his wife went and checked into the famous room 217. Now, having the entire hotel to themselves, save the few remaining staff left before the break, they were served dinner at a long and empty table. King stated all the other chairs were sat upside down and stored on top of the tables. He also said there was some orchestrated music coming down a hallway, and he felt as though the timing for this atmosphere was perfect. Tabby went on up to the room and decided to go to sleep, and Stephen roamed the halls. He found himself in the downstairs bar, this being while he was still drinking, and was being poured drinks by a bartender by the name of Grady. Those of you that have seen the movie or have read the book, you know exactly who that is. He then meandered up to his room, his imagination running wild. It's also said that he thought he saw two little girls in a hallway that weren't actually there. King also said that once he got back to the room, he went into the bathroom, pulled a pink shower curtain back and thought to himself, what if someone had died in this bathtub? He said that that night he had a nightmare about his small son running for his life, you know, from the fire hose. And by the time he and his wife left the hotel, the book was all but written in his mind. 
The Stanley Hotel is now very well known for being the main inspiration for the novel, and it attracts so many people from all over the world. They have a hedge maze, of course, but it was planted after the movie's success. Stephen King still visits the hotel from time to time, and a few Ghost Hunter television shows have featured the hotel as well. In fact, the hotel really has reclaimed its former glory due to Stephen King. The Shining was Stephen King's third novel after Carrie and Salem's Lot. Now, I couldn't seem to find a running count for how many copies of The Shining have sold as of today, but as of 2012, it was well over a million copies, and I'd say sales have increased dramatically after the recent release of the sequel, Dr. Sleep, as well as the newly released movie of the sequel about Danny when he's grown which, side note, was also most excellent and showed respect for both Kubrick's movie for those fans as well as King's original book. So as I stated before, King is most certainly not a fan of the movie adaptation of his book. He described the movie as too cold and that there was, quote, no sense of emotional investment in the family whatsoever, unquote. He also was not crazy about Shelley Duvall's portrayal of Wendy, calling her a, quote, scream machine, and saying that, quote, there's no sense of her involvement in the family dynamic at all, and Kubert didn't seem to have any idea that Jack Nicholson was playing the same motorcycle psycho that he played in all of those biker films he did. The guy is crazy, so where is the tragedy? If the guy shows up for his job interview and he's already bonkers, no, I hated what Kubrick did with that." Unquote. Stephen actually wrote the screenplay for the movie. He went on to say, quote, I doubt Kubrick ever read it before making his film. He knew what he wanted to do with the story, and he hired the novelist Diane Johnson to write a draft of the screenplay based on what he wanted to emphasize. Then he redid it himself. I was really disappointed." Unquote. So when the film adaptation of Dr. Sleep was being created, the producers approached King with understandable trepidation because of his disappointment in the original Shining movie, you know. They approached King and tried to explain that so many people who loved his novel also really love the movie even though his fans know that he doesn't like it. The producers wanted to and the director wanted to somehow incorporate the personality and the tone of the Overlook Hotel as well as Jack's legacy from the movie and so forth and still show respect for King's book. Well, much to everyone's surprise, King understood completely. And I know you're going to ask, so the answer is yes, he approves of the Dr. Sleep movie. With the utmost respect to Mr. King and his original novel, and I nearly worship this man. I have read The Shining so many times, I've had to buy new copies over the years. The movie The Shining firmly stands on its own two feet as a cinema masterpiece. The long and uncomfortable shots, including my favorite of Jack Nicholson's face as he stares unblinking out of a hotel window, are indescribably haunting. Thanks for listening. <laughs>